Welcome to the second of our roundtable discussions, Restoring the Future, Regenerative Strategies for the Anthropocene Transition. I'm your host, Ken McLeod, coming to you from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the Australian first people who cared for countless generations for this country on which the city of Sydney now stands. Once again, our roundtable panellists are Morag Gamble, permaculture designer and trainer, educationist, author and eco-village pioneer. Daniel Christian Wall, author, researcher, educationist, consultant and activist. Welcome, Daniel. Shells Marshall, indigenous ecologist, marine biologist, uh, um, land care ranger and researcher, and Jason Twill, regenerative urban planner, land, land care, uh, sorry, developer and consultant. Today's roundtable discussion is going to be led by Daniel, and our theme will be bioregional economies and subsidiarity enabling life to create conditions conducive to life. But first, I'd like to invite Shells to acknowledge the ancient cultural traditions of this continent now called Australia. Ginnage, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome tonight. Um, I just want to start by giving um, acknowledgement uh, to the forests and the ocean that binds us all, um, the totem of Gumbangi uh, Bari, uh, my Jogun, which is uh, my area's totem and um, our language group as well. Um, to my family, uh, all the fish in the ocean. Um, I also will take this time to pay respect and to honour the Indigenous uh, people of the world who continue to speak uh, with, with truth uh, for equity um, on this planet. Also to the people who wake up each day and step forward uh, to making planet Earth safe and a better world to live in for all life. Thank you, Charles. So it's indeed a pleasure to welcome Daniel tonight to be our, our discussion leader. Uh, Daniel uh, was originally trained as a biologist and holds degrees in biology, holistic science and natural design. He's a director or advisor to a long list of institutions and uh, organizations around the world and teaches regularly at the famous Schumacher College in the United Kingdom. Daniel lives with his partner and their daughter on Mallorca and works locally and internationally as a consultant, educator and activist. Daniel's 2016 book, Designing Regenerative Cultures, quickly gained international acclaim. His blog, on Medium is followed by over 20,000 people and his social media ad advocacy has a combined audience of over 450,000. So we're very privileged to be in this group tonight with Daniel, <laughs> a small drop in the ocean. Daniel, over to you. Thank you so much. and. Um, the privilege is all mine. I'm, I'm really enjoying that. We had a wonderful conversation last time and this is such a nice panel to have a conversation with that I don't really want to take up a huge amount of time because um, I think the richness is in the conversation. But maybe I'll unpack that long title, Bioregional Economies and Subsidiarity Enabling Life to Create Conditions Conducive to Life a little bit. Maybe the first one to start with is what is subsidiarity because that's a bit, bit of a mouthful and a lot of people might not have heard this term. Um, I looked it up on Wikipedia and um, Wikipedia says it's the principle that central, central authority should have a subsidiary function performing only those tasks that cannot be performed 
by a more at a more local level. Um, another way of saying that is also it's a change in our structure of governance that enables true participation of everybody because people will only fully participate in the fate of their community and the fate of their region if they feel that their voice actually has a way of being heard and matters and um, this idea that we elect national Polit political representatives at national government level every four years and then trust that they do a less bad job than the ones we didn't elect um, is something that is actually holding us to my mind back from really enabling people to come together and take the fate of their bioregion into their own hands and really start co-creating and, and we're now at a point where that is increasingly important. Um, I think for a lot of people who've just lived through the lockdown scenarios of the pandemic, we've began to realize how important, Morag spoke to that strongly yes, uh, the, the last time, um, how important our local farmers are, how important our local producers are, because those just-in-time production, large international supply lines that are ramified all over the world where even the suppliers of our of of suppliers are on another continent and we we just we don't really know quite yet we will see in the next few months the unfolding of the repercussions of this lockdown on global supply and demand and um in the historically in this enormous push towards globalization that started in the mid 90s where even companies that were proudly producing in their region for the region or even in their region and then also for international export but 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 trying to keep the production and the resourcing as local as possible just didn't have a chance if they didn't globalize and and played that international game and now we're realizing that that that's incredibly um, fragile and that in this move towards economic efficiency we have cut so, uh, cut at local and regional level the redundancies and the the capacity to meet basic needs for people in a way that is biting us in the back now and um to my mind in order to truly address this issue we have to put a lot of effort into relocalization and re-regionalization friend of mine helena norberg hodge right livelihood award winner and um, author of the wonderful book ancient futures uh, just recently on on, on sunday um, organized a, a wonderful event called the world localization day uh, with speakers from all over the world uh, it's still live if you just google a world localization day they've put together a four-hour program with noam chomsky and rob hopkins and so many other people um, from all over the world uh, contributing it's it's really worth watching and for, for me this bioregional term is is something that comes out of my own 20-year journey in all of this um for, for a very long time i was very active in the global eco village network and um Ecovillage movement lived in an eco village in Scotland at Findhorn, uh, helped to spread the news on the transition town impulse and worked with Forest Transition Town and, and um, a number of other transition towns around the world. And um, so my focus was very much on how do we create the whole systems design at the community level? How do we put all the pieces of the puzzle in place to create a sustainable community? And I've moved on a little bit from that by under, through understanding that very often these, these intentional community projects, which are wonderful laboratories of innovation and, um, and learning, uh, in the very effort of establishing themselves, not by any malicious, but because it's hard work to build a village from scratch, um, often forget the link to their region. And 
then it takes a long time afterwards to, to retrofit that and, and reach out again to their bioregional context. But beyond that even, I've also realized that there are certain things that do need a little bit of an economy of scale. They don't need to be globalized and, and scaled up to massive um, mega projects that in, in their very nature cannot be sustainable um, or regenerative. But uh, it is at the bioregional scale that we can begin to re-inhabit the earth. Like I, in, in, in my book, I, I speak a lot about the fact that what we're called to do now is to redesign the human impact and presence on earth within the lifetime of the generations alive today. And we have to redesign it in such a way that the overall impact of humanity stops being degenerative, exploitative, and, and negative to people and planet, but it becomes regenerative again and replenishing and restorative. Um, and the only way we can do that is to fit back into the patterns of our ancestors that Chell spoke to, of the oceans, of the birds, the land animals, the community of life as a whole, not just humanity. And if we look at a map today, we see these very straight lines that were literally drawn by the rulers of rulers, by colonialists, by, but, but these nation states, the 200 and a few nation states that we now have around the planet, are actually relatively recent sociopolitical inventions. And it's in that era of power over, of nation states suppressing um, parts of their population and um, other people, the first inhabitants of many places that, that, that during colonialism, people just arrived in a place, planted a flag and said, it's ours now. Um, and it's that very structure that I think we need to, it will take generations. I'm not saying this is a, this is a fast moving uh, change, but, but if we begin to redesign our human impact on, on earth, we need to pay attention to the biophysical reality of the bioregions we inhabit. And what do I mean by bioregions? It's uh, some people to make it easy speak of watersheds as a good idea, a good first approximation of a bioregion. The, the watersheds of rivers give you a that's a biophysical reality. They they often connect a number of local ecosystems into a wider area that um, is a biophysical and geographical reality and not a political sociopolitical reality. And um, also, of course. Now that so many of our human, um, the members of the human species have moved into cities, although that's beginning to now change again, post pandemic, a lot of people have realized that um, cities are, hyper dense cities are maybe not such a pleasant place to live in a, in a world where pandemics might become more frequent. Um, but we do need to, if we want to be effective in redesigning the human impact on earth, we need to also think about how do we redesign cities. And um, one of the founding fathers of town planning, a Scot named Sir Patrick Geddes, over a hundred and by now 110 years ago in a book called Cities and Evolution, spoke about the only way to plan a city well or a town well is to do so within the context of its bioregion. Um, he had this wonderful image called the valley section where from the mountains down to the sea, he he kind of situated the city with regard to its resource base and um, began the first movement of really connecting people to place again. He worked a lot with the French sociologist Le Play's idea of people, work and place. And I think that triad is, is still very functional today. We need to if we want to create bioregional economies, we, we need to pay attention to re-regionalizing our economic system as well again, because right now the globalized economy is stacked against bioregional production for bioregional consumption. Um, there are so many externalities to the mass production far away 
social, social externalities and environmental externalities that are not figured into the price of things. And then there are international trade rules that, that actually make it difficult for people to create uh, any kind of law at the local or, or national level that says we should favor local pro production because it has less climate impact, it creates more vibrant local economies, and it, it helps our people in our place, um, the IMF would come, come and, and, and take issue with that. And so we, uh, in order to enable people to really begin this re-regionalization, re-inhabit process of becoming native to place again. Even uh, Chelsea is going to talk about this um, in, the, in the next series, the, the, the notion of re-indigenization, that, that all of us are indigenous to planet Earth. All of us, are, if we choose to, we can re-root ourselves in our places, but we need to really begin to learn our places again. So many people don't know what the migratory species in their area are. Um, what what people ate before um, we started to reduce our dietary habits to just a few um, commodity crops that are globally traded. Um, we need to re really relearn from our elders. And if, if in some, some areas this has been eroded for so many generations now that we, we can't even speak to the people anymore that have an idea of um, what it was like before globalization. But a lot of areas in the global south, in, in Africa, in South America, and in parts of Asia, still have this knowledge in living memory. And um, that is a really enormous human resource that we shouldn't ignore and that we need to ha harvest and learn from be be before um, these people pass on. And um, the whole process of building regenerative communities has to be in the context of the next greater whole that these communities sit in. Um, the whole process of building regenerative cities has to be in the next greater context that the cities sit in, and that's the bioregion. And of course, because place is fractal, if we work in our local community and in our bioregion, we are also healing the planet. We are regenerating the planet. It isn't an issue of, well, the, 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 the problems are now so large, we all have to work at the planetary scale, and how do we scale it up? The whole notion of scaling up is a mistaken notion. Um, regeneration is patterned by the biocultural uniqueness of place. We have to really pay attention to what we can learn from the history of our places, people who lived there before us, what we can learn from the uniqueness of the ecosystems we inhabit. And then once we think in that way, we can actually create a whole new era of innovation and in the process of re-regionalization, create vibrant bioregional economies that pay attention to um, what is the kind of biomaterials feedstock that we can grow in this area in a way that we regenerate so soils, regenerate forest cover, lock down carbon from the atmosphere into biomaterials and into the soil. And with other processes like, like um, you using fungi and um, there, there are certain biological processes that allow us to capture carbon through biosequestration in plant matter and then turn that carbon, the biological carbon, into geological carbon through bioassisted processes, often through, through fungal processes. Because in, in terms of the responding to climate change issue, it isn't actually enough to just biosequester into biomass. Um, because the biological carbon cycle is only 300 years. So we would very quickly hit a ceiling on how much carbon we can draw back down into living matter and soil. But through this, coupling it with geosequestration, but again, as geotherapy in humble attendance to the uniqueness of place, N none of these large geoengineering projects of sending mirrors out into space or of or, or ferrous oxide seeding the oceans. And it's, it's such a hubris to think that we can 
safely geoengineer at that scale. Every time we've done things at that scale, we messed it up hugely. And um, we, we've already made the global system so brittle now that, that we better not mess around too much because we, we don't have a lot, of more, lot more chances to get it wrong. Um, we, we need to begin to get it right. And the place to get it right, to my mind, is at this bioregional scale. Um, what I learned from working with, with eco-villages and, and, and sustainable communities is that um, it simply isn't, like, it's, it's not a scale where you truly are forced to include all the diversity present. But when you move to the bioregional scale, then the conversations really hit the messy, wicked problem complexity that, that life is all about. Then you have to look at what are the current strong economies in this region and not see them as evil and other, but begin to have a conversation with them of how could they regionalize? How could they, like even large international companies are beginning to um, explore what it would be like to move into becoming regenerative. To my mind, many of these multinationals are too large not to fail. They're just at the wrong scale. But what they could do if, you, if they looked at, instead of, if, if they really looked at the potential that is in the people that are part of these companies, most of them good people who also have children, who also care about the future, um, they could reinvent themselves to enable global networks of collaboration that decentralize manufacturing again towards a regional scale. And in that process, we would begin to answer a lot of the, the, the problems that we have now with, with mass unemployment in many places. And, um, and we, at the core of it is building food sovereignty at the local and bioregional scale, water sovereignty at the local and bioregional scale, energy sovereignty from renewables at the local and bioregional scale, um, building transport systems that, that aren't all based on private cars, but are non-emitting, non-carbon emitting transport system based on electric cars. And in some areas it might be hydrogen, but clean hydrogen made from renewables. Um, there's, there's so many technical aspects to this. And we pretty much have the technological solutions for this re-regionalization process. But I really want to stress that this is not a technical issue. It is really also a narrative issue, a worldview issue, a community and a social issue that through this process of really involving people to care about their place and their region again, to begin to re-identify with that place and to, to ask the question, how can I most express my unique essence, my unique gift to life in service to my community and my region? Because the, 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 the way we can regeneratively express ourselves is always in the context of the next by the whole. You can't really live a regenerative life without serving your community. And you can't create a regenerative community without that community serving the region. And if, if, if we do that, then, and if, and the important thing here is that, because there is, there's, there's another current on the planet which is very dangerous at the moment, which is right-wing um, nationalists uh, also jumping on a sort of regional agenda, but from all the wrong, for all the wrong reasons. Um, the, the importance here is that we also need to address the scars of the past and, and the damage and trauma of the past of colonialism and, and violent um, neoliberal uh, globalization. And we need to, in privileged regions in the global north, not just pay attention to our bioregional lifeboats and safety for a turbulent future, um, as, as, as some people always uh, like to frame it, but we need to enable people everywhere to do that. And that means um, knowledge exchange, technology exchange, and uh, probably debt jubilees, uh, helping people in the global south to build the capacity to help themselves and, and understand that this is not a issue of being also generous in 
offering some development money to the global south this is a reparation payment for the damage that we've done over centuries for for um the the plundering that has gone on for 400 500 years around the planet and um if we don't heal those errors of the past then we we won't be able to create a regenerative human presence on earth in time because the 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 time is ticking climate change is really upon us um, if you've followed the news the temperatures in in northern siberia are scary like we've never seen this before of having 38 degrees centigrade in northern siberia um that's an area that's normally under permafrost um once that permafrost melts and releases methane uh, the runaway feedback loops in the climate system get to a point where where re-sequestering that carbon will be increasingly difficult or impossible so uh, the time is ticking um but i feel that more and more people are identifying that this bioregional scale is actually where the action lies um whether it's the planetary health alliance focused on bioregionalism or the capital institutes regenerative communities network creating bioregional initiatives on on many parts of the the globe from from southern england um isabella calais wonderful um bioregional learning center in the uk lots of initiatives in in um north america in costa rica um in new zealand wonderful um maori led initiative in the auckland bay area um there are so many hopeful initiatives i'm i'm here on an island in um in the mediterranean called mallorca the reason why i moved there is because islands are wonderful case studies for bioregional regeneration and um in this process of re-regionalizing we actually create and and healing the local ecosystems putting effort into building bioregional economies that are restorative and regenerative by design that that um have the incentive to heal the soil and replant the forests and heal the local watersheds built into their economic structure we can not only create a system that is much more able to weather the next 3 4 decades which will be bumpy with climate change um which will probably have a see a number of pandemics of the one uh, of of the severity of the one that we're currently in the middle of and um it's this building that redundancy and resilience at different scales again that that allows us to come home to really come back to community to really and 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 I'm, i really don't just mean the human community but i mean the wider community of life that we so critically depend upon and and um our ancestors all over the globe knew that the land does not belong to us we belong to the land and i think that is a and we are expressions of the land and creating conditions conducive to life what life does best that's the central lesson lesson of biomimicry is something that we can life builds from the ground up it doesn't build build top down we need to retrofit all these levels from local to regional to global um that we've that eroded over the last um 400 years and i would love to to hear um what what the other panelists have to to add to that i know jason's working very much with cities and there's a real uh, like the whole bioregional um urban development issue is something that that um it would be wonderful to hear you speak to and and chels um we have so much to to learn from the knowledge that you and your ancestors stewarded for 40,000 years of how to live in place again um and 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 more like um we need to re-record the last session because we had a bit of a glip of of not recording it you spoke so wonderfully to the importance of local food economies and 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 like the whole notion of 
not just a watershed, but a food shed, a fiber shed, a biomaterials shed, meaning what is the region that we draw our key, the key resources from where we can meet human needs, but in a way that we actually become a regenerative presence on the planet. So that's, I'll, I'll leave it open to the panel from here. <laughs> Or would you, Ken? Well, who, who wants to pick up the, uh, the many threads that, uh, that, just one of them to begin with, the many threads that, uh, that Daniel has just uh, woven? Don't be shy. All right, now I'll jump in. <laughs> um, first, this is Jason, and I want to acknowledge Daniel for his incredible gift and his contribution to the movement. Um, you're one of the best writers I've come across and one of the most brilliant, beautiful minds, and you give 110% of yourself to this movement in the world. So thank you for sharing that with everybody. Um, I'm really grateful to call you a friend and learn from you. It is a really crucial issue. I saw a note in there from a panelist on Q&A about what defines a bioregion, which Daniel was just talking about. like. It, for me, I've always understood it as the biodiversity and ecosystem services a scale that supports the conditions conducive to life. So it is that kind of watershed scale, that life shed um, that has the food, provision, soil nutrients, you know, water cycle um, that allows life to happen in that place. And I think about how we grow up on West Coast US, traditional Eurocentric American school system. <laughs> You know, my first association with maps are all political boundaries. Like you're playing little puzzle games and you're putting little states into the map, right? So my mental model for or mental map for maps was always associated with political boundaries. And you really don't, you get older and you're learning about science and then you see that blue marble view of, from NASA, you know, the first time that space, you know, the earth was viewed from space and there's no lines on that planet. <laughs> Um, so the construct of human, you know, ec economies, political economies of drawing lines across the world is largely a Western paradigm, right? And I've learned, you know, seeing the Atasis map of Australia, um, it's very, very different. Actually, I can show that. I'm, I'll give a little visual cue if it's okay, Ken. Um, and permission to show one of your slides, Chels? <laughs> All right. Um, Let's see if I can do this. Can we, oh, can I even share slides? I think I can. If people can see this. This is just basically helps you understand the visualization of, um, if you can see the screen, you know, the, the Western paradigm political just draw lines for seven states across the country, straight through the country versus on the right, is the you know pre-Western contact of Australia, like the I would say the bi-regional governed clans or community groups of Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, of which there are a myriad, all associated as some shore with a food source, a water source, um, or custodianship of certain certain species of flora and fauna that are associated with those boundaries and bioregions. Um, that's missing from our political economic context. Um, where I started to learn more about this from the realm of cities, Daniel was in Seattle, right? So New York, I knew the Croton water system. I kind of, as a Manhattanite, you don't really get to see much nature. It takes a while to drive through cities to get there. Um, although I also learned from Ann Winston Spurn that cities are nature, and it's just the way that we think about them. Um, but really where I saw bioregional collaboration and bioregional thinking was when I was in Seattle and we talk about the Cascadia bioregion that goes from Northern California up to Alaska. Um, and we started to look at how we harmonize political discussions or policies related to climate change, water protection, life shed protection, so to speak. And it was collaborating across that broad spectrum of area, primarily thinking about salmon which had a strong context of the cultural identity of that region going back to the first peoples. That was their economy, that was their livelihood, that was their totem. Um, and when we started bringing city making in the context of how we protect salmon, it changed the way we localized a bioregional thinking and our impacts of 
they're urbanizing, you know, the Northwest in a way that had no adverse impact on the salmon habitats. So we created a kind of, I guess, a place-based program called Salmon Safe that looked at how we designed our roads, buildings, and infrastructure that we knew would have no adverse impact on the, oh, there we go, Cascadia bioregion, um, on salmon. And that required us having, like Janine taught me to have, uh, you know, biologists and marine biologists at the design table who were teaching me as a developer that we couldn't use certain facade materials because they were endocrine disruptors for fish or other species. So it really taught us things that we would never know unless we had those experts around us giving that diversity of thought. Um, but it also, when we're teaching and educating our kids in schools, K through 12 or higher ed, it's crucial that we give them an association. I mean, Charles will talk about growing up in a, in a, in a culture where there's totemic relationships and more, which he talked about last session, that associate with you the mental model of your bioregion and your, your nation's kind of footprint. Um, I had to take, I teach, I teach, I graduate students at UW, I used to take them out to the watershed in the Cascadia Mountains, and then I took them to the waste treatment plant, so they actually saw the full drop of rain cycle from where the catchment was all the way down through the city, how it got there, and then where it went on the back end. But then we also went to non-point discharge and did kayaking down the Duwamish River to pick up waste. So they saw the, I guess, the non-point street off run from urban environments. So that they started to develop a mental map of our bioregion in Seattle. Because they just don't. Their whole, their whole association was like, here's our square block of land. We're going to plug into the infrastructure and build this thing and not really think about where it's coming from or where it's really going. So most people don't know where their water catchment is if you ask them. So that's something that we have to reprogram into our thinking. Um, and there's so many incredible lessons that I've learned from, from Chells and, and first peoples all over the world on you know, how the story of bioregionalism is ingrained in the culture and the storytelling and raising of children, not only formally in school, but in the home and how it's talked about and how people spend time on the country. Um, and it's hard to have that because our association in the cities is so you go to the supermarket, you don't know where your food really is coming from, most people, um, and you go visit nature to go hiking on the weekend, right? So it's, it's really changing that paradigm. And we're starting to get into that dialogue of how do we even change our place naming? Like, I, I can't wait till we get to a point where I can say, hey, what watershed are you from? You know, think about the way that we name places in our, in our mental identity of place. You know, if we start to change that dialogue, you know, we can start to shift. Some of the new communities that Charles and I have been involved with planning here, we were, we were designing around water catchments and hoping that we can basically build that culture into a new community so people can say that. Where's your watershed? <laughs> um, but I'll pass on to the other wonderful people who kind of continue the thread. I can, I can, I'll, I'll have a go, um, have a go. Um, so I'm glad that you put that map up, um, Jason, and um, yeah, I've, I've noticed a comment here from, from Sandra, yes. Um, yeah, the, the, the cultures that are existing on that map are still ongoing and strong and continuing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of this uh, paradigm shift that we're sort of trying to make people aware of is that um, yeah, Indigenous um, people and, and culture in Australia uh, throughout time, you know, got it right and had it right. And, um, you know, if we look and draw upon the, the aspects of those paradigms and thought processes to help as something in, in the toolbox to move towards, you know, people understanding, you know, the restoration of this planet that, you know, our, our mother is in essential, you know, palliative care. And anyone that, that's sick, you know, you usually have the emotional intelligence to then assist, yeah? And that map, um, I was going to talk to that map, Jason, so you was zoning into my mind frame. Um, if you look at those, 
the, the existing language groups uh, in Australia and how diverse it was. Um, yeah, you're looking at more than what, 250, you know, 300, 800 sort of dialects and, and variations of language and, and groups. Um, you know, all these areas are an example of these, these local and um, regional trade areas. Um, and, and that's how things functioned. And you know, in a lot of places still to do today, you know. Um, so that, that practice is, is basically embedded um, you know, so much that you know, a lot of this, this regional trade and regional um, get together or, or, or dialect or, or exchange, you know, was embedded that it was actually timed and planned um, around ecological um, seasons. So a lot of that movement and that, you know, action of, of, of regional trade and regional interaction was around seasons. And that's something that Morag um, spoke to before is that whole um, eating and operating and working within the construct of um, seasonality um, that also then goes with those local bioregions and the local happenings within the area. You know, it's things like you know when 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 mullet are migrating. You know, you've got a you've got a food base and a resource to be able to host your visitors. Um, you've got something that can then you know extend into offering um, as your you know uh, your giving or your contribution. You know. To, to showing people you know, your country and, and what's going on in your country and the functions and systems within your country. Um, you know, these, these ecological um, cycles and these e ecological um, systems or atmospheric systems as well and geological systems, yeah, that they also had social constructs attached to them. So, you know, in these social constructs, you know, you, you had things like ceremony, or you still do, and, and harvests and dance and art. So this whole social construct of existence, you know, revolved around, you know, these, these, this seasonality and ecological time, and then which then came back to the local areas and regionalism and bioregionalism within those areas. You know, it's not a new ideology. It's, it's been around for a very long time and it worked. It worked 100% and it worked so much, as Daniel said, that you know, it was in existence for 40,000 years and still exists today as we sit here. Um, and a lot of that sort of mindset, that paradigm, that mind frame is still existing in Australia. And, you know, we'd all be idiots if we don't start drawing upon that knowledge that's left and that logic that's still existing. And not only in Australia, but in other countries throughout the world where Indigenous people, you know, led and showed, you know, what true sustainability is and the principles and the nexus and the foundations of what that consists of. And a lot of it has to do with that equity and it's equity in knowing your place, you know, within the planet and not taking too much and as, as much as you need. It's about, you know, knowing that every living organism has a right to exist. Over to you, Morag, I think. Uh, thanks, Charles. Gosh, thanks, everyone. Such a, a rich... A rich conversation, there's so many threads that I'd, I'd love to pick up on. But I think I'll start with what Charles was just saying there about um, the need to, to really have that emotional intelligence to respond to what's happening. And something that I wanted to, to bring up was that I think that really the way that we need to focus on this restoring um, bioregions is through an economy of, of love, an economy of care. And it's, and it's through those enriching relationships that we build with community, with place, and when we begin to really have a sense of who we are in that place and to actually really love and respect and care for that place, that things start to shift, that we start to live in a way that we're actually taking care of, of the waterways, of the resources, of, of the people who are living there. Um, I just wanted to give like a really little example of of when we start to think about all different aspects of our lives being more place-based and, and, and connected. Um, I built this 
little house that we, we have here at the Eco Village at Crystal Waters. I've been living here for, for 20 years. And one of the, uh, so my benches in the kitchen, for example, are uh, benches that are made from the timber, from the ridge across. I know exactly where the timber has come from and I know why that particular tree was removed. It wasn't just part of a big um, clear cutting, going down to the hardware and picking some timber the right size. The tree had to come out because it was about to fall on some cabins. It was rotted out. So we, we harvested that and we, we um, slabbed it up and stored it under the house for, for 12 months until it was right. And then we picked the shape of it and we actually designed the benches around that. And my dad helped me do it. And this part of this, when I look at that bench, it, this deep sense of connected, like we take care of that bench. It's not like, oh, it's just, well, if we damage it, we can just chuck it out. So it's a, this sense of deep respect and care when you have, have a relationship to the resource, you have a relationship to the place where it's from, you have a relationship to the people that are involved in the process. Another example, um, when we're making a little chicken house, um, here at Crystal Waters, there's a, a guy called Peter who has a woodlot. 20 years ago, he started this woodlot on the, on the south side of the slope where it's no good for, for building houses or growing food. And so it's, uh, we've pretty much made half of um, Crystal Waters Eco Village, which is about 650 acres, is regeneration. And so no one touches that bit. But there's little pockets where we can create um, harvest zones for, for timber. So I needed some timber for, for building a chicken house. So I went over to Peter and I said, oh, can, what have you got? And so we walked around the forest and, he, and we picked the particular trees that we thought would be appropriate for it. And he said, come back tomorrow. So, you know, when I, every day when I walk down past my chicken house and I go in and look after them, I have this sense of relationship to the forest, to the land, to the soil, to the people, and, and, there's a, and there's a respect. And so I think when we start to get that relationship of love and care, we're far less wasteful of the things that we use. We're far more appreciative of all the different elements of, of that. Um, and so, you know, there's a few things that I wanted to touch on too, just about um, this idea of the local economy. I live in, a, I live in quite an extraordinary little place. I realise um, every day how wonderful it is. The local Mullaney community, so Crystal Waters, where I live, is an eco-village that exists within this broader sense of, uh, of living a more ecological life. Not completely, but there is this broader sense of that. So very much a connection of where we are in the catchment connection to um, indigenous culture. There's the, there's the Banya festival that happens here that's been re-instigated after a hundred years. Um, the Banya is this amazing tree which has 10 uh, kilogram uh, pine cones that, that fall around January. And so every January there's a, there's a Banya festival and there's a whole, there's a whole tradition that's been going for, you know, I don't know how long, Charles, it's been going. Maybe you can, you know anything about that. But it, it, it stopped about 100 years ago, but it's been re-instigated. But interestingly, our local currency is also called the Bunya. And so we have a local, uh, a local economic exchange system. We also have a local bank. Uh, when, when people started doing the back to the land thing here in, in uh, the Mullaney region, there was not much going on. It was a dying rural town. And so one of the things that was the first thing to get started was, was a local bank and a local food co-op. And so through a whole lot of cooperatives, we've been able to sort of revitalise this local area and, and to really shift uh, how, the, how the community feels about this place, a lot of regenerative work, uh, land cooperatives, um, and the bank is interesting too because um, it's owned by the community and they have eco loans. So if you want to actually get a loan for something and you're doing something more ecological, they'll give you a better rate. Sometimes when you go in there, there'll be a whole lot of trees there from the local land care group. So you go in there to do some banking and you get some free indigenous trees for your landscape. Um, if at the end of the year when they've got a, um, a surplus, it's not sucked away somewhere else. The community decides what they want to do with the surplus. And so when you start to have a sense of control of your, of your local money, um, even your local currency, of your local food system, of connecting with the, 
um, the Indigenous celebrations that have been going on for a very long time of, of creating communities such as Crystal Waters where 86% of the land that this community lives on is common land. So there's again that sense of commons. Um, and you know, all of this has been done consciously over the last 30 years. And the restoration that's happened in people's minds as well as in the landscape is so evident. And, and it's, a, it's a choice, it's a definite choice. And it's a sense of design. It's design of how we live, it's design of our economic systems, it's design of how we actually cultivate our relationships with one another and with the land and with um, indigenous communities. Thanks, Thank Norek. Right. Um, there's a couple of questions that came in uh, early. There's there's a few that are that are scrolling over on the chat and the Q and A. But uh, there's a couple that came in early from people who couldn't be here. One was from uh, uh, Jan Sebastian in Colombia, who for who this time is very very difficult because of time zones. And he uh, addressed a, a question, which I'll just see if I can find here, uh, to um, Daniel. He said, what does Daniel think about blockchain, uh, not, not only related to Bitcoin currency, but blockchain-based smart contracts as a technological means to build a worldwide food safety network of producers and retailers. Should we trust companies, um, tech, tech, the tech giants such as oh, IBM and, and Microsoft, which are using their cloud infrastructure to build custom blockchains for their customers? Daniel. Um, <laughs> I think I just want to pick up on something that Charles also spoke to that, that really our species has been a bioregional species um, through most of our history. It's, it's almost when we, when we moved away from that, that, that we went um, down a track that we started to be more degenerative than regenerative. Doesn't mean that there haven't been examples of, of um, our ancestors also overstepping the, the carrying capacities of their region or, um, or degrading certain areas, but in most places, like we now know that most of the Colombian um, Amazonian rainforest is a forest garden that um, people as place have stewarded and, and helped grow in the way that it, um, it's there today. And to come to this technological question, I, I think we need to be really aware that technology is always a double-edged sword. We, we've been aware of this through most of our history. Um, it's in the Torah that the story of the golem is about, watch out the technology. Uh, Goethe's Faust, the, the wizard apprentice, is about technology. Um, watch out what magic you unleash, the magic becomes your master. Um, and um, as Arthur C. Clarke says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, I'm saying this because I have to hold up my hand that I increasingly want to watch out very carefully where to use technology and where not to use it. And um, I think we need to have a much more open conversation as a global species and in our local communities and regions, um, how we apply technology. Because um, in, in, the, in the language of Buckminster Fuller, um, if you want to change the way people think, don't tell them what to think, give them a tool, the use of which will change the way they think. And if you reflect on that statement with regard to what we're doing here right now, this virtual presencing, wonderful, mm -hmm. we're having conversations across, spanning, literally spanning the globe from the Mediterranean to Australia. Um, that's the wonderful side of it, but it is restructuring how we interact. And I see lots of people in the global regeneration movement spending days on Zoom calls, on global networking, on building the network of networks. And in my life, I've realized that over the last four years, I've actually somehow 
missed the right balance. I got sucked into this, oh, we, it's time, we need to build the global movement. And I've literally lost grounding. My, I've started, my, my, my roots that I've been growing on this island for 10 years have, have atrophied over the last four years and they've not become stronger. I, I need to readdress that balance. And, and very lo long roundabout way to talk about blockchain. Um, I, I, I'm worried that A, once these big tech giants get into the game, um, as I said earlier, some of them are just simply too large not to fail. And they're, what, they're, what they're trying to build is to retrofit a food system that is still global in exchange. And we, of course we will have global trade. And I'm in, but but, but I, I think building lower tech local solutions will create a, a yet again the, the redundancies and, and the capacity to buffer the failure of large global technological solutions. So I, I would always, I don't want to be radical in saying I don't go there, but I also want to, don't want to endorse it in, in, in a huge way. Um, because again, there's this, like I know that there are wonderful people out there in, in the world, like for example, people from um, the region network um, trying to create protocols by which to demonstrate the regenerative impact on a piece of land so a farmer can begin to be paid not just for the produce that they create a surplus from their regenerative farming, but um, also for the actual act of regenerating, for the carbon sequestration, for the, the proof of state change, the, the positive impact they've had on a piece of land they were farming. Sounds great, is great. And if that then means that only farmers who are willing to have a smartphone, who are willing to sit a certain amount of time in front of the computer to, to do this work and to get, to buy into this system, we, you're, you're colonializing the mind of peasant farmers, which to this day are still feeding more than half of humanity. It's a lie that large global agribusiness and the green revolution feeds the planet it it's killing the planet it's killing the soil and and so um in this strange transition phase of a dying system that we need to hospice and a new system that is much more regionalized again that, that we need to midwife we are in the middle space where we have to navigate the dilemma between how do we deal with these impulses that large companies are trying to do build these technological platforms to do this kind of work. Um, but we also have to be vigilant of how they do it and, and understand them at very best as transition strategies to build stronger regional networks. We, we don't need to have strawberries out of season. We don't need to have a global food system that makes butter from New Zealand cheaper in Scotland than the local butter from a Scottish Highland farmer. Um, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and uh, yeah, be aware of the double-edged sword of technology. It is um, colonializing our minds in a way that, that, that um, very few of us are f fully conscious of. I think uh, Helen or Norberg, Norberg Hodge, who you referred to earlier, uh, produced some very interesting figures on how much uh, international trade is a kind of um, uh, exchange at great cost of things that are produced locally. So that, you know, one country produces X goods and it also, uh, which it exports and it also imports the same goods. It's just, uh, it's really quite crazy. Anybody else want to come in on that question, Daniel, um, Jason? Yeah, just, I think it's a really important one. And it's always important to recognize that technology is usually evolves from the mental model of its creator. So when those big companies are doing that, um, and when Charles and I have a colleague here that's doing some really interesting work in embedding indigenous knowledge systems into artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that mental model is, is programmed in that different, you know, epistemology and ontology, which is crucial to looking. So the technology, 
it's always been a struggle in this movement because like the technocrats come in they're like they start from that technical level without having the mental model governance process culture that beliefs and values that should inform that technology to be useful to a place mm. um which is crucial um so we're actually looking at I'm involved with some people in Europe right now looking at an app that has nudge technology and behavioral sciences to help people make them more aware of their lifestyle decisions and habits and behaviors towards unsustainable life living. So it, it learns their behavior and creates an avatar of their best possible self, their regenerative self, maybe, their regenerative life. So it helps, you know, the same way we use it for health and exercise, more holistically looking at our footprint. And it can learn, you can learn from it and teach, you can teach you how to live a more regenerative life. And, and how we do that with kids is huge. The whole education system has to be redone. Um, this whole notion of regenerative education, you know, getting into the K through 12 graduate school level, like we're, we're wholeheartedly misteaching sustainability across the planet. Hmm. Um, I had a really good chat with Mace about this this week as well, because we're looking at, you know, there's a woman that we talked, we talked about this last week at our prep call. This is such a huge topic and the work that you're doing with youth Morag, what happens with how you raise children in your clan shells, um, you know, how that starts to fold into this institutionalized school system that, you know, our youth go through, but don't get this kind of education or they get a very technocratic education, green education, not regenerative. That's actually shifting their minds and teaching them think, how to think to actually start to come up with the solutions, maybe technology, maybe not, that actually meet the science of the challenge at the scale of the challenge that we're dealing with and the speed of the challenge that we're dealing with. Um, blockchain, I like blockchain as it relates to enabling a more cooperative economy and supporting power back to people and owning the institutions in our society, like the financing institutions in the hands of people and not in corporations. So I have been following the pattern of that movement, you know, that how blockchain plays a role in democratic socialism, right? And, and, and moving and shifting power back to communities so that it enables them to track these things and hyper-localize their economy in a way that they, they are empowered to own it. It's not just in the hands of some company back in Europe or in the US somewhere or anywhere else or China. And it's, it's there, they can see it and they have, you know, ownership of that economy in front of them. I see it for that. I haven't seen anyone really fully unpack that. Maybe someone in the panel has seen that. I know there are people working on that, um, but I'm tracking it as it relates to how we, how we redefine cooperative housing, cooperative food systems, cooperative mobility, cooperative banking um, in our communities and how blockchain can enable that, facilitate that in a much more cost-effective way, um, and put power back into people's hands. I just want to briefly come in on that because on the one hand, it sounds so wonderful kind of using blockchain protocols to create um, the enabling structures for more subsidiary decision making and taking the power back to people. But um, I've been tracking the countries like Switzerland where, where um, referendums are quite common, where a lot of issues are ta taken to the people. And not all of the referendums come out with um, wonderful results like they... Um, I had a referendum against the building of mosques in, in, in Switzerland. Um, and the, the reason why I'm mentioning that is that I feel like you mentioned education. If we bring power back to the people, which is absolutely necessary, we also need to do that coupled with education because after decades and centuries of mass manipulation of media poisoning the minds of people and 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 most people don't really um want to spend their days learning and studying up on every decision in their local region and then vote through blockchain on every issue in their region and because they won't this is open for demagogues to then very popular in in, in a populist way um, influence people through social media and then rather than having deeply informed participatory decisions at the local level we just get mobs being hyped up to go in quickly and just press the button to vote and have a voice 
but they've actually not really had the voice. They've been manipulated by um, the the social media infrastructure that 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 is 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 playing with our minds. So it, it's it's a it's a double edged sword yet again, I think. Well, it's. Um... I don't know if anyone here has have seen the film The Rise and Rise of Michael Rimmer. It's a film that the English comedian uh, Peter Cook made some years ago. And it precisely, although it's pre-digital age, it precisely deals with this question. And of course, it, 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 this debate often loses sight of the fact that democracy is essentially a deliberative process. It's not just pushing a button and voting. It's not about polling. That's a marketing technique. It's not a, a democratic technique. We've got a question from Matt, who says, so many regional communities are in stress. Here in Eastern Australia, we have had drought, then fire, and now COVID-19. What skills are needed to be developed in regional communities as a whole? I'll jump in first. <laughs> you guys are biting at the bit. I can see it. One thing I wanted to um, add on that map of Australia, um, if you have a look, that uh, and, and, and if you really go in and have a look at it, you know, the, the language map of Australia, um, you'll see that all those different colours represent different uh, resource partitioning. And those resource partitioning um, boundaries are basically based on the landscape capabilities within that local or regional um, area and, and the seasonal functionality of th those capabilities. Yeah, that's, that's really smart. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's essentially where we want to be um, in, in, in that whole sort of direction. Um, and, you know, in Eastern Australia, um, yeah, that's that's essentially you know on on the coastline where I'm sitting. And yes, you know the 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 impacts that we've had, you know, probably over the last fifteen years, um, you know, it's 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 making it's 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 forcing people actually to realise that you know uh, as humans we're not invincible. So at some point in our uh, intelligence we need to become uh, resilient and adaptable and these are the two primary things that you know indigenous people throughout Australia and the world were able to do as experts was be able to come through these natural disasters these climatic fluctuations and changes to be able to manage and control fire on this landscape and to utilize it to the, the to the 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 ability of basically you know, turning this whole continent into what I call like a um, you know an, another eco garden where things were so finely tuned and managed that you know you didn't have to have any fear the fear came from you know your actions in harming this landscape that's where the fear came from of stepping over the line, stepping over the boundary of taking and pushing too far. You know, that's when the forces would come back at you and bite you on the bum. It wasn't so much about the fear of, you know, having flood, the fear of having drought or the fear of having fire in the landscape. It was the fear of overstepping the mark of, you know, what you were doing environmentally. And it's that reason, very reason why we're having these issues in the first place is that we have overstepped the mark. And yes, it's coming back to bite us in the butt. And, you know, one of the things when you talk about fire, you know, if Aboriginal people in Australia didn't have to succumb to the treatment and, you know, all the horrible things that happen in Australia, you know, we'd still have a landscape that looked like a, a immaculate park or, you know, a botanical garden. It's when these sort of, this intelligence and when these sort of things are shut out of the debate and shut out of, you know, the conversation that 
things then start to get railroaded and overridden by other people's you know ideologies and concepts of how the world and the the globe and the planet should be and these people's ideologies and their points should not be the dominant forces that then force us to be able or force us to, into a position where we have to become adaptable and we have to become resilient and we have to start changing you know who we are and how we live yeah you know, it should be a natural progression of intelligence Anyone else want to take that up before we take another question? No. Um, there was another early question that. Just very briefly, um, uh, some resources. Um, I mean, Morag's doing wonderful work with through through um, youth and permaculture and, and education. So, that lo lots lots to learn there in terms of skills. Um, the whole global permaculture network the agroforestry network gaia education the online course that gaia education offers and designed for sustainability is a great place to start because it maps out all sorts of other places where you can deepen your learning um gaia, gaia university is another outfit that runs very um, practical action learning courses where you can do a course and also implement your local project at the same time um they're every year more offerings to build that capacity at the local scale. So um, very easy to, to find um, once you start looking. I might just jump in there. Thanks, yeah. Daniel, for the, for the link. And thanks, Charles. Um, linking into the, well, a few of the parts of the conversation, and I think something that um, Jason said earlier too about how he immersed his students in understanding, you know, the whole catchment. And I think that's a really important part is that that, that immersion process of the education, you know, we can, we can create technological ways of offering people information, but until they actually feel it, see it, taste it, touch it, know it, have it unpacked and, and have an immersion in that, <clears throat> I'm not sure that they really get it. It's still always just knowing about sustainability or knowing about regeneration. And in our heads, we can do it. And, and, I, and I was uh, one of the volunteers for, for Helena Norbuk Hodge in Ladakh in 1992 when I was about 20 something. And I remember meeting with a young, um, young Ladakhi man there and he was telling us about the education system there and how it was failing their young people. And he was saying, and, and I think this is even in the film, he was saying um, at the film Ancient Futures, you know, we're learning, we're, we're spending six days a week in school and we're learning how to read and write. I can, the students can write how to make a cup of tea. You know, you put the tea in and you boil the water and do all that. But, you know, they can't actually make a cup of tea. <laughs> just, I feel the same with the, you know, the sustainability and regenerative world. Like we, we can write it, we know it, we read it, we have great theories about it, but how are we actually living? Do we know how, how to live? Do we know how to live without the fear that Charles was saying of, of the loss? Are we surrounding ourselves with abundance and knowledge about how to, how to you know, rebuild things if something goes wrong? You know, where is that re resilience? You know, with, when we make things so efficient and just in time, there's, there's not the slack. You know, whereas if you're surrounding yourself in a landscape that has that level of abundance and robustness and you understand how it works and how to fix stuff and how to make things and how to plant things and how to, you know, you have a sense of how you can be if something goes wrong or who to go to or how to manage it and where, you know, you have a deeper sense of what it means to be in that place. And it isn't a fearful thing. And I, and, and so this immersion experience, and so that's why I actually think um, places like the eco villages, Daniel, the, and you know places like Crystal Waters, like they're they're not the solution to everything, but they're places where people can come, and dive in and really experience what that might look like, and then start to get the skills and the thinking to be able to ripple that out into their own neighbourhoods and their own communities. And and I think it's important. Not, not I don't want everyone. You know, the, the answer is not everyone moving out to eco-villages. That would never work. I mean, we're, but the idea is about how do you take the lessons from those types of ways of connecting with place, connecting with community, um, connecting with culture, having a deeper sense of what it means to live a regenerative life and to understand your, 
uh, impact and where and how you can meet your basic needs and to be um, living a beautiful and abundant life. It's not about going backwards. It's about moving forward in a way that, that brings all the things that are really important and will actually enable us to continue. And that's where I feel like this, the education, that's why I focus too a lot on, on the perma youth because uh, the education that they're not get that they're getting at the moment is not at all the type that they need. And um, my daughter, a uh, 14 year old girl has just quit school. And she said, it has no, it is, there's nothing in there that's really addressing what we need in the world today. And I can see, you know, I work a lot with kids who I know, courageous. I can see a lot of kids who are that age, the 13, 14, 15 year olds, they're being impacted by hearing everything that's going on. They watch what's happening. You know, they're aware of all the climate action there, but still then they go back into the school system and then they just not hearing anything. Then they're not even learning the SDGs, let alone anything to do with regenerative culture, designing regenerative cultures. So this is where the perma youth for me is coming really strongly. Um, I actually had a, um, I'm as well as linking them together with each other around the world. Um, they're linking in with um, refugee groups, with indigenous groups. Um, I just uh, had had them online with Fritjof Capra the other day. There was a, a group of them, and they'd prepared some questions for Fritjof. And so um, his his book, you know, the Systems View of Life, we're actually going to get a group of young people to try and work out how to translate that into something that makes sense for them. And and so we're we're actually taking a group of people through this regenerative education and then trying to find ways to share that out as far and wide as possible um, to lift the lid on, on, on the type of education that young people are getting, particularly in that age. And it's super exciting. I just feel like that's, that's where I'd like to spend a lot of my time focusing. I'll give you some slight inspiration on that. Like when I was with the Living Future Institute, we did a living, we wanted all schools should be living buildings, right? So the immersion that the building represents the kind of mental model we're trying to inculcate in the next generation. So there's a school we built in Seattle that had a river going through it, you know, water was there, they were growing food, so the students had to learn how to grow their own food. Um, but just, because it was in a city that was, you know, trying to make that, bring that natural environment biophilically into the school. So that they were using so you know everything around them was the new normal solar panels renewable energy electric cars food growth nature coming in birds and animals around so it kind of reprogrammed them as, as kids that was preschool or primary school um, but every school should be like that it should be a cathedral for like nature and learning and being immersed in the living world um, and this, i'd rather my kids spend three months up with chels and learning and beg understanding of her country than sitting in a classroom being crammed with like, you know, knowledge and being tested on it. There's, there's so much disconnection between understanding the teenage, for the young, the young brain and its development space and how we teach them this new worldview. I think that book is gonna be incredibly awesome to read interpreted through the lens of a teenager. I mean, that'd be amazing. And we need yours. To, uh, I, my next one too, Daniel, would be, I have, I have them all stacked up here. Then it's that one. <laughs> and this one from what, it, you know, Rob Hopkins. So these are the, this is, these are the new textbooks, I believe, for the, uh, what, where we need our young people to be focusing on. And of course, this discussion draws attention to the fact that it's, not just about young people. I think we all have a lot of unlearning to do. Um, we, we mention was made by Daniel earlier about uh, efficiency and Morag, you, talk, you mentioned just in time uh, approaches to management. We've succeeded in creating extremely brittle systems because we've paired them back to be efficient. And of course, from that point of view, from that engineering, modern, modern management point of view, nature is hugely over-specified. You know, it, there's so much redundancy in nature and, that, and that's what creates resilience. 
Uh, Daniel, there was a question for you, and it might have to be the last question that we that we uh, take tonight. And I just can't find it. Here it is. Um, it was about the sustainable development goals. Um, to what extent do you consider the United Nations sustainable development goals account for and therefore for provide for regenerative developments and endeavors? Is there scope for more thorough such consideration th through the context of the SDGs? And if so, how might that happen? I'll keep it really quick because uh, I'd li like to hear other voices before we uh, lock off. Um, I've already put a link to a set of resources I developed for Guy Education, um, which is a set of flashcards to help communities ask the right questions about how to use the SDGs as a platform at the local level where they can bring in business and they can bring in um, local authority and kind of uh, hold them to the words that they are pr pronouncing now that they're aligned with the SDGs, but then do an Aikido with the SDGs to really make them s sensible at the local scale. Because one thing I'll say is um, a systemic implementation of the, the SDGs is impossible unless we reframe SDG number eight, which has the growth imperative built into the like it, it, it still speaks to that we need continuous economic growth. Mm -hmm. And it, that is actually what is at the heart of the degenerative process. Um, if we don't redesign our economic system to not um, have this growth imperative built into it, um, we won't get any implementation done. But th that, that said, I wouldn't just dismiss the SDGs, but use them wisely. Um, because they are a wonderful platform. And there's, there's also, uh, I'm just putting another link in, I had a conversation with Fritjof Kapra about the, the SDGs, um, which, which people might find useful because Fritjof done some really interesting work on the, the systemic uh, implementation of the SDGs. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. I know Jason needs to go very soon, so maybe we can give Jason an, um, uh, another opportunity, no? Okay. Maybe we can squeeze one more question in. Um, well, there's another one here from Liz Morgan. Uh, to some degree, various responses to COVID-19 pan pandemic have, illus have illustrated how subsidiarity can work in an emergency. For example, here in Australia, the states had different responses to different circumstances. Scotland's breakaway response to the UK does this offer any hope that subsidiarity is a principle that can be more broadly applied in defiance of globalization's uh, dictates, especially in light of Daniel's comments about multinationals? Well, I, I certainly feel that that's an opportunity now for our movements to um, use the examples of COVID and how things have become possible that were previously just un thinkable in a, in, a, in a matter of just a few weeks to, to basically say, well, we, we can, if we want to, build structures that are much more regional. Um, on the island I, I lived, uh, live on, the response was stunning with regard to the support of local farmers. Within no time, local farmers built up a online platform where people in their households could order from local farmers and could get the veg box delivered to the doorstep. I've been doing that for since I've moved here, but but within very short time, almost everybody on, on this island had direct links to local producers. And even because so many of the local producers, the local milk factory was selling 60% of its production, not through shops, but directly to hotels, but then the hotels were empty. So the government stepped in and made a public announcement, please buy local milk. And, and so we like just use in your local conversation, use this as a leverage point to, to keep that conversation going, that it's not about some sort of hippie self-sufficiency dream to build local um, self-reliance and, and, and self-sufficiency. It is actually the way that we 
shockproof ourselves against future pandemics and climate change disruptions and all of that. And, and so, yeah, there's a huge opportunity. And, and again, very briefly to the education question, let's not believe that there is an end point to the journey we are on. The, the whole idea that we can create, if we have the right things in place, we can create the sustainable place or the sustainable community. Life is a journey of learning. The journey of being regenerative is an evolutionary journey of continuous change. We need to, once we understand, because Chell spoke to that as well, with, with her people over 40,000 years knowing how to weather disruptions, the disruptions will come. But if we know how to weather them and we don't, if we believe that we're on a path that just continues and that we need to walk together collectively as a process of learning that is lifelong, that is not in the th first third of life and then, then you forget about learning. Yeah? Um, both sustainability and re regeneration is a community-based learning process and we will never stop being on that journey and we will never get there. The whole point is the journey. Uh, thank you, Daniel. That was a nice segue into something that I want to uh, uh, say to people, uh, uh, give a notice of, and then I'll ask Chills and Morag if they would like to say, make some uh, closing comments. Um, Daniel mentioned earlier on that uh, we had a bit of a um, a computer stuff up last time in that the software on my computer um, froze and when we uh, got it going again the recording dropped out and even though it was set to record automatically and so we we did not record the wonderful session that that uh, that Morag um, led last fortnight uh, however, here's the good news. On the 30th of June, uh, Morag and Chels will both per participate in a, uh, a session called uh, Regenerative Agriculture and Food Systems. Ch Chels bringing in that tradition of, of uh, Australian Indigenous um, land management and Morag with uh, the work that she talked about last time, plus many other things, I'm sure. And we'll also be joined by Anne Gibson from the Maloon Institute, uh, who's, they specialise in, in uh, regenerative agriculture and partic particularly rehydrolyzing the, uh, the landscape, bringing water back into the landscape. And Robert Pekin, who was the founder of the Food Connect project in Brisbane, in, and the Food Connect uh, Foundation. So that should be a very good session. It will be on Tuesday, the 30th of June. It will be in the morning, unfortunately, for people like Daniel. <laughs> it will be in the middle of the night. Um, it will be 9.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. So let me know if you're interested in, in getting an invitation to that. We'll also, we're also hope, hoping to do a fifth round table which will reprise uh, the the first one um, if we can fit it in to people's schedules after the fourth one so you're not going to miss out on anything so chels words of wisdom to send us home with <laughs> Words of wisdom to send you home with. I'm, I'm going to um, share with you um, some words of wisdom that I had this week from my 11-year-old um, daughter, um, who, like your daughter, Moray, she's uh, obviously been influenced by a really cool uh, woman uh, in her life. Um, and we, we're, we're in the process at the moment of... Um, planting uh, you know, 5,000 trees. So we're made, making part of our property a koala sanctuary um, after the fires and you know, everything that's happening. And there's you know, just taking on um, you know, some of that burden and, and journey of the koala. Um, you know, and we, we were going to get some uh, patches made up for the rangers, for the indigenous rangers that you know, in solidarity with our brothers and sisters throughout the world that had you know, 
Black Lives Matter. And I had my 11 year old daughter, um, you know, quite quickly remind me that, you know, all life matters. Um, and I think that would be my sign off tonight is just to remember that all life matters and that's equity for everything. Every living species on this planet deserves to be here and deserves a place. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Charles. It was a lovely note to finish up on. And Morag, have you got some words of wisdom? No, I think they're beautiful words of wisdom to end on. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Kenneth. And thank you, thank you Daniel, for your uh, contribution tonight, leading the discussion, covering so much ground and, and so much of it uh, so rich in content and in heart. And uh, I thank you for that and look forward to seeing all, you all again. Same, same time, same channel <laughs> in a fortnight. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everyone. Thanks Bye -bye. for coming along. Thanks.